Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Chat episode 399, featuring an interview with David Craddock. Uh, now, I've had David on before to talk about his book, uh, Stay a While and Listen, which is a really wonderful book about uh, Diablo. Uh, but at this time, he's back uh, with a book called Rocket Jump, uh, Quake in the Golden Age of First-Person Shooters. Of course, that's about a game that probably doesn't get as much attention as Doom or maybe even a Wolfenstein 3D, but uh, David thinks it's a really, really important and it's a really dramatic story about uh, that game's development, as you know from uh, watching my interviews with John Romero here on this show. Uh, but David's gone far, <laughs> you know, far uh, above all and above and beyond that. Uh, he's interviewed uh, Romero, uh, Carmack, uh, Peterson, Hall, just about anybody you could think of associated with the uh, Quake franchise, and it's all in his really, really amazing book project. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Craddock. All right, folks, I am joined once again by David Craddock. He is a, an author. Uh, he, of course, did Stay a While and Listen, which we talked about last time, but he's also got Dungeon Hacks and a new uh, book uh, that's the subject of this interview uh, called Rocket Jump, Quake in the Golden Age of First-Person Shooters. And that book is uh, due out this spring. It explores the making of the Quake franchise and examines the personalities and the studio culture of id Software. Sounds like a great project. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing pretty well, Matt. First time I was on, I stayed a while and you listened, and then it's been a while since <laughs> I've been back on, so we're kind of closing the loop here. <clears throat> well, why a book about Quake? I love Quake and, and Doom and Duke Nukem 3D and all of those really colorful shooters from the 1990s as much as I love Diablo and Diablo 2. Um, so right now uh, I'm kind of a, a full-time freelancer of sorts for ShackNews.com. And a lot of people don't know this, but Shack News actually started 21 years ago around the same time Quake launched. It started as a Quake fan site called Quake Holio. And then it became Sugar Shack. Quake Holio. Shaq Quake Holio. <laughs> Uh, death match for your bunghole. I don't, I don't know what the tagline was, but um, they, uh, they, they kind of broadened, you know, Shack News broadened its coverage from Quake mods and Quake patches and news to covering the, the industry at large. Uh, and in fact, uh, Shack News is special to me because it's the first place that gave me a, a paycheck as a writer, much to their chagrin. But I, I, I got a lot better. <laughs> I step came... into professionalism. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, it, it, you know, it was a great set. I love writing the first time around. I kind of, I went for a while, did a lot of freelancing, wrote some books, and I, I've been back since uh, since April of 2016. And they have me writing long form features, which is kind of a forte of mine. And and the the editor in chief and owner over there, Asif Khan, said. Um, this is after I'd written two. I wrote a long form feature on the Crystal Dynamics Tomb Raider reboot and then on Doom 2016. And he said, you know, for the next one, we should really do something on Quake, kind of pay homage to our roots as well as, as Quakes. And uh, I have kind of a tendency to go on, as, as, as you know from this answer, it's going on a little bit. But um, uh, the Tomb Raider feature was pretty long. The Doom was even longer and Rocket Jump when we published it in December, I wrote it over three or four months. It was around 500 pages. It was the biggest article oh, in the site's history. 500 pages, that's impressive. 500 pages. Uh, you know, when you see long read on the internet, you don't think long 500 <laughs> pages long. Um, but what I did with it, I kind of wanted to play around with the format. I wanted to, there, there are 10 main chapters, and those cover the Quake games made in-house at id. So Quake 1, 2, 3, Live, and Champions. Um, but then I also kind of wanted to play with the the article books structure. I also wanted to explore other first person shooters in the 90 to kind of see, you know, how id Software and Quake kind of influenced them. So these other these there are these breakout chapters that I call pause screens that explore uh, Duke Nukem 3D, Rise of the Triad, Team Fortress, Star Wars Dark Forces, and all of those chapters have a different structure. Some are narrative structure like a typical book. Others are Q&A interviews, others are oral history, and that, that kind of brings us to um, now it's, it's crowdfunded. I'm crowdfunding Rocket Jump on Unbound as a hardcover book, so you don't have to read it at your computer. If you crowdfund this, you'll be able to put it on your shelf. 
I hadn't heard of that one before. Was it Unbound? Unbound is why yeah, that. It's, why that instead of old Kickstarter or so? It's that's interesting. Um, so we published Rocket Jump on Shack News last December, and it kind of blew up on social media after John Romero and John Carmack, both of whom I interviewed, uh, retweeted it. And I got a tweet, or a, a, I guess a Twitter direct message one day from a guy named Matthew at Unbound. They had heard of it, they'd read it, and they wanted to work with me to publish it in hardcover. And I, I'd kind of heard of them, but I did some more research. And what Unbound is, is they're a, a uh, crowdfunding platform slash publisher devoted specifically to books. Um, and unlike Kickstarter, I guess most Kickstarter campaigns run over 30 days Unbound runs campaigns over 90 days um, because they, you know, for, for Rocket Jump, for example, instead of just a plain book with text and maybe, you know, 10 pages of black and white photos in the middle, this is going to be a really collector's edition style hardcover with really nice layout, glossy pages, color photos. So it's a longer campaign because there's a little bit more funding involved to produce something like that. But it's going pretty well so far. Uh, it's been up for about two weeks and uh, just today. I announced a new pledge tier. If you pledge to the Super Collector tier, John Romero and I will both autograph the book. He's actually wow. really excited about it, been a big supporter, and so it was really, it was really. I mean, you know how it is. You've spoken to more game developers than I have. Here are our heroes growing up, and they're like, "Oh, I like your book. I'll sign it if they, if you want me to sign it." So it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, that's really sounding like a must-have collectible. Uh, for anybody who likes Quake, and I assume that's the majority of the <laughs> it <is. laughs> this audience. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, David, another part of your title here is uh, the golden a the golden age yeah. of a first person shooter. So uh, we wanted to get into that a little bit because uh, you know somebody might say well, this is the golden age, right? Or maybe it was <laughs> Half Life Two or whatever. Uh, right. So why are you uh, pointing at this era as as the golden age? I guess it's I guess it's a golden age in the context of, of creativity. I don't think anyone could argue that today first person shooters, namely Battlefield and Call of Duty, it's a golden age in terms of profit, but more for those two franchises and for for EA and and Activision. Uh the 1990s was a golden age because sure, even some of the best first person shooters only sold a million or two, but there was so much creativity. There was uh, you know, just the glut of Doom clones, but there are also very original games, such as Dark Forces, such as Duke Nukem 3D. In fact, one thing, I interviewed Scott Miller of Apogee and 3D Realms, and he said, you know what, we helped, of course, they helped id get their start, but he said, when we designed Rise of the Triad and Duke Nukem 3D, we very purposely looked at what id was doing, and we tried to take a lateral step, because we knew we couldn't compete with them in, in Doom or Quake, but we said, well, you know what, id's games, they're, they're really great, technical sh uh, show pieces but they don't have a lot of character so that's why they made duke kind of a wise cracking cracking loud mouth they really went all in on interactive level design whereas you know doom and quake as great as they are it's very much find the key card shoot all the things get to the exit and and that's that's kind of why i love the 90s as a golden era there's such a variety of first person shooters out there in terms of level design gameplay and theme so we've kind of already talked a little bit about this one but uh what what era does this book focus on? This the book as far as, um, as, far as Id's <laughs> role. Sure, this. yeah, it goes from about I would say 1996. Um, well, actually 1995 when Quake started its, it's first version um, through 2017. I did get to talk to studio director uh, Tim Willits. Oh, about yeah. Quake Champions. And, of course, Tim is uh, one of only a few original Quake veterans left at the studio, along with Kevin Cloud, I think. I think they're the two last there. Um, and uh, I really went all in on, on that specific time period. And I also touch on other projects that were a part of its history and were in some way touched by Quake. For example, I spoke with Graham Devine, the lead designer of Quake 3, who said, yeah, you know, after uh, we shipped Quake 3 and then Quake 3 Team Arena expansion, we were working on uh, an MMO called Quest. And it was in the very early stages, but he kind of wanted to take everything id had learned about building a multiplayer infrastructure on Quake 3 and kind of throw their hat in the, uh, you know, then burgeoning MMO ring. But um, most people in the company were kind of saying, no, that's not what we do. We make shooters and, and Doom 3 kind of won out. 
Hmm. And I, I love Doom 3, but, you know, I think to, to, to think that Id making an MMO, that would have been something pretty cool. <laughs> that would have been <laughs> to really say the cool. Least. Uh, so you've already mentioned a couple people here, Tim and uh, Scott. The two Johns, Miller. yes. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've really interviewed a lot of people for this book. I mean, how many people did you interview? I can't even tell you the count off the top of my head. I started with, I always start with John Romero because he's he's been a fan of my work, I'm flattered to say, and he's always said, you know what, uh, my Rolodex is your Rolodex. Uh, he put me in contact with Sandy Peterson. Uh, he helped me get in touch with American McGee, who is actually, I already talked with him here and there because he was an early reader on Stay Well and Listen. Uh, so it was, let's see, John Carmack and Romero, Tim Willett, Sandy Peterson, American McGee, uh, Janelle Jaquise, uh, Graham Devine, just kind of a hodgepodge of people from throughout Quake's history. And then for uh, for the pause screen chapters on other games, I spoke with you know Tom Hall about Rise of the Triad. I spoke with uh, Richard Levelord Gray and then Scott Miller. Scott Miller told me about this, that, and the other, but also about Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, I spoke with Justin Chin, who was the director of uh, Star Wars Dark Forces 2 and the lead animator in the first game. So I really tried to cast a, a wide net for this book. I'm impressed that you got in touch with John Carmack. i <laughs> trying to get him on this show for years now. So I'll tell you, that's another, I have to stroke my ego for a bit. I found his, his email, his Oculus email, and I emailed and said, hi, John, you know, I'm a big fan. And then last spring, I published this article on the new Doom, and I wondered if I could talk to you about Quake. He emailed me back within 20 minutes. He said, oh, David, I loved your Doom feature. I'd be happy to talk. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I want that That's awesome. engraved on my tombstones. So that was kind of a big <laughs> career moment for me. It was, it was a pleasure to get to, to speak with John. That's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, so all these interviews, and I guess you've done plenty of your own research, but uh, what was something that came out of these interviews that really shocked you or that was uh, you didn't see coming? I have to tell you that um, <laughs> I don't want to throw any mud, but id Software was a pretty dysfunctional place. Uh, but, you know, all of the turmoil inside, you really, it almost, Quake 1, I kind of think of as a window into the turmoil. Because Quake 1, if you're just, you know, your average gamer, just but you buy the game, you install it, you play, and you're like, why am I jumping from, from military bases in the far future to these medieval castles? And it's because, well, you know, John Romero had a lot of plans for Quake 1's design that really couldn't come to fruition for various reasons. And there was just, over time, as it became bigger, there wasn't really... Mom or Dad weren't there, you know? There was no one to... No producers during that era to really kind of keep people in line and say, okay, kids, quit... Quit backbiting. Game. Yeah, just let's focus on making a game. And um, I think for better or for worse, Bethesda has has given them that kind of structure they need. Um, but I, I think that what I learned most of all was that as dysfunctional as it could be, and for all the frankly kind of disgusting and, and shocking stuff, the stories that I heard, <laughs> those guys un indisputably made some of the greatest, most influential games of all time. In fact, I th Quake Three, is, uh, Quake Two, actually might be my favorite Quake. I think it's criminally overlooked in terms of its single-player campaign. I, I think you can. There's a clear evolutionary line from Quake Two, what Quake Two did, to what Half Life did uh, months later. I remember when I had Romero on. I don't know how many years ago that was. <laughs> That's been. <laughs> we talked about Quake. I remember him saying something that. Uh, something like how disappointed he was because he really wanted it to be a huge leap forward from Doom, and he felt like it was it wasn't different enough, I guess. Or he didn't get to uh, do. Has, has he kind of evolved that opinion since then, or does it's, it still seem? <laughs> he's sticking to those guns, pun intended. Yeah. Um, the way he told it was that you know he had grand plans for it, but for a variety of reasons, it just couldn't come through. Because so you know. You could probably talk to you a lot about id's methodology. Those guys crunch for fun. Making video games was life. Um, they they say they wanted to see who could stay latest at the studio. Not that it was a competition, but because why go home? This is the greatest place on earth. They're making games with their friends. These guys are almost as tight as as family. And as Romero told it to me, what happened was just burnout. There were so many people who you know they'd gone from Commander Keen to Doom, to Doom 2, and then to Quake. And by, you know, John actually spoke with me with Candor. He said, I guess over the course of talking with people, I got a lot of 
opinions on where Romero could have done a little bit better. And and he actually said, yeah, you know, it's it's fair to say maybe I did play a little bit too much deathmatch. I, uh, I, I, when I should have been shoring up design, I was playing a lot of deathmatch. But one of the themes I kind of learned there was, you know, these guys were just human. Romero, he said, one of my favorite quotes from this book is he said, I was just having fun. It was like, look at the poor kid. Look how far he came. Imagine all of these guys who who go. It's kind of a rags to riches story. They they're they're waking up in the morning and saying, "Gee, what Ferrari should I drive to work?" And they're making the greatest games on the planet. I mean, a lot of people could say Doom and Quake are the best games ever. I would find it difficult to argue with them. And you know, everybody there just did a lot of growing up. But yeah, uh, uh, the too long didn't listen version. I guess Romero said, "Yeah, you know, for a lot of reasons." Um, people there were just so tired, so exhausted from, you know, working for so many years that they just said, you know what, Quake's technology, the engine was, I think John Carmack said it was the toughest time he'd ever had up to that point. The engine was slow to come along and everyone said, let's just make another Doom. And that's kind of what happened with Quake. And Romero was pretty disappointed in that. He he was very clear to say he's proud of Quake, yeah. but he's always said, you know, I think as good as Quake turned out, I always wish we could have experimented a little bit more. So what kind of sense did you get from Carmack on it? Carmack was, um, so for interviewing him, he actually, I had to jump through a lot of hoops through Oculus because I was told, you know, you can't mention anything, you know, no VR, no Facebook, no ZeniMax, all of that stuff is strictly taboo. And we did interviews over email. He decided that was the best way so that he could think through his answers. And so I had only a certain set of questions I could send him. And Carmack said, the way he put it, it was a really good quote. I can't think of the top of my head. He said, but we, we aimed high, we leapt, and we missed. And I think he kind of felt that, um, you know, Romero's design wasn't quite there. It wasn't where it needed to be. But he was also very frank in saying, yes, the Quake's engine came together very slowly because it was up to that point the hardest work I had ever done. It was a true 3D engine, and that was that was quite a learning curve. A lot of the folks that watch this show, really, huge fans of Doom and, and Quake, the whole nine yards, right? So uh, for somebody like that that already feels like they know everything there is to know, uh, what can they expect to learn from this book? Well, I think that right now the gold standard in terms of id Software biographies is Masters of Doom uh, by David Kushner. And I certainly wouldn't argue with that. Masters, Kush, uh, Masters of Doom was very influential on me and my writing style, my career. But it was written over a certain time period and kind of ends after Quake. And I, I believe Kushner has gone back and kind of added addendums a little bit here and there. But Rocket Jump goes into Quake 2 uh, and Quake 3 and Quake Live in a way that, to my knowledge, no other book has. There might be some stories scattered about piecemeal on the Internet. But if you're like me and don't have all day to piece that together, Rocket Jump does that. It takes you behind closed doors as Masters of Doom did over, over a period of history that that book did not cover just because of when it was written. Yeah, I think maybe in some ways this, the Quake era would be the more dramatic era. It certainly it was. Certainly but more, it also, uh, you know, <laughs> things started to fall apart. <laughs> that's where things started to fall apart. But, I mean, believe it or not, things were kind of, they hit their crescendo in terms of dysfunction on Quake 2. Because of the way a lot of people described it, even people who on the one hand had an issue with, with John Romero on Quake 1, they said, you know, John Romero was a, a visionary in this office. He was, he was the fun presence. He made sure everybody cut loose. He was having a lot of fun with design. And with him gone, there was kind of this mean edge that entered into the company going forward. I have a question here from uh, Philippe. He says it would be nice to hear about how and why the rocket jump in the game was made. This is a great story. Um, it's totally emergent behavior. The way that the id folks told it to me was, um, you know, in Quake, you could record demos and you could upload them. And if you were on the end user, you could download them and watch them in your game. And the id developers would do that and they saw people... No, just pointing the rocket at their feet, jumping and then firing. And they realized, wow, if you do this, you can just completely breeze through the levels because we didn't know about this maneuver and we certainly didn't build our levels to account for it. I think just recently, uh, Brenda 
Romero, uh, a great game designer, and of course, John's wife, interviewed him. I just watched a video interview this morning, and he said, uh, you know, I would set par times for, I think, at E2M1, if you play it through the first time, it takes like half an hour. If you rocket jump, less than 15 seconds. Wow. And so it was this total accidental thing. And I think John Romero told me that Tom Hall, even though he wasn't at it at the time, he was still playing it games, he's kind of the rocket jump champion because he would get an invulnerability pack and he could like <laughs> kind of pogo rocket jump across entire levels he was that dexterous at the at the maneuver it was pretty cool so what's one of your favorite anecdotes from writing this book uh well like i said earlier quake 2 is in my opinion it was very well received but it was also came out kind of right on the cusp of half-life so in some ways it got overlooked oh, in terms yeah. of its campaign and i loved learning about Quake 2's kind of uh, interconnected level design. And uh, the way it was told to me was that that was kind of a guiding feature of Quake 2's design. And it was it was a new thing for id, because Quake 2 was in many ways a by-the-numbers id shooter. But the way they connected their campaign and the fact that they gave you goals other than find the key card, get to the exit, made that made Quake 2 into a cohesive world. And um, everyone I talked to gave credit to, um, you know, the a lot of the Kevin Cloud. It was his game design. And uh, I think that it was just a lot of fun. And Quake 2 covers two chapters in Rocket Jump because I just wanted to really dig into how Quake 2's campaign came together. It's one of the classics. All right, well, thank you so much, David, for taking the time out to talk about your book. Uh, for people listening that want to get a hold of this thing, uh, where can they go to learn more about Rocket Jump? Absolutely. It is being crowdfunded on Unbound right now. You can go to unbound.com slash books slash rocket dash jump. And we have, just like Kickstarter, there are different pledge tiers. You can get a digital book, hardcover, signed hardcover, and as of... Uh, today, we just added uh, the Super Collector tier where John Romero and Super I will sign your book. Tier. The Super Collector. <laughs> and there's there's a lot of different packs. There's Co-op for you and a friend. Uh, there's the God Mode, which is the highest tier where you get my entire library of books all signed in addition to Rocket Chunk. Well, you so, get about 12 books or so at this point, right? I... They add it up. It's you do funny. a lot of just fiction, too, huh? Uh, yeah, it's more fiction. Got a novel coming out later this year, a couple of them. And it's funny, my wife used to say, how many books have you written? I could count them on one hand. And the other day I went, well, I, like, I had to think about it. So it's, it's uh, and Rocket Jump is is, yeah. is the latest. And it's also, I'm, I'm really proud. The Rocket Jump title is kind of a double yeah, entendre. Yeah. It's very thematic. So I, I think people really, really like the story in the book. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you Thank are. You. Everybody else is. So, uh, <laughs> thanks again, and yeah, I'll see you uh, uh, next book, I guess. Yes, I hope probably sooner than later. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> uh, that's all for this week's episode. Uh, I should be back next week with the first in a new series of interviews with Steve Ince. Uh, this is the writer behind Beneath the Still Sky, the Broken Sword games, all those wonderful uh, revolution point-and-click adventure games we played back on our Amigas, or I guess uh, Dawson. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure Broken Sword is on a whole bunch of systems. But anyway, I'm sure you're familiar with the games, and if not, I think you have a lot of fun learning about those. Uh, if you got questions for Steve about uh, the Revolution games, or maybe just about what it's uh, just sort of general game writing questions, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer those, and I'll, I'll be sure that he gets them. Uh, of course, I want to thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> uh, for supporting uh, Matt Chat. Uh, you can do that on Patreon. All I ask is a buck a show. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, pretty soon now, I've got these uh, special magical mystery items. Uh, they've arrived. I've been packaging them, getting them ready for shipment. Uh, those should be going out uh, hopefully early next week. And I think, <laughs> I think you guys are just going to be blown away uh, by these uh, collectible items. Uh, so I won't say anything more about it. I want to let you be surprised, and I think you'll have fun uh, telling your friends about it, uh, your fellow Matt Chatters, that when you get those. Uh, if you have accumulated over 100 bucks in of support for Matt Chat, 
uh, just make sure you go to that Patreon site, uh, go to the your Matt Chat pledge page there, edit that to include your shipping information, because uh, otherwise, you know, I'm just going to keep going <laughs> down the list. Uh, so, you know, what can I say? Try to get on that. Shouldn't take but a couple of minutes maybe to input that information, and uh, we can get that done. But I know you guys are really going to love these items. I mean, <laughs> almost don't want to ship them out because I kind of just want to keep them all uh, to myself. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a thank you gift uh, for you guys. Uh, so I think you'll really like that. So uh, just keep an eye on that mailbox. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, so first bit of news, uh, one, of course, if you want a copy of David's book, and I mean, <laughs> who doesn't? I'd like to get at least a couple of these things. Maybe I'll go for that uh, double bonus option. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's on this uh, page called Unbound. Uh, so first, don't get it confused with Kickstarter. I'll put a link in the show notes to this site. Um, right now, it's at 12% funding with about 100-something backers, and it's $15 for the digital copy, but of course, you're going to want the hardcover for $45. And like David was saying, uh, there are some other options where you can get it signed by him or even by John Romero. Uh, lots of fun options there, so definitely go check that out. Uh, if you've seen uh, David's other books, you know he's a great writer. And, and you can even read the, uh, the stuff on Shack News. Uh, that's freely available. Uh, so if you want to just kind of get a feel for his style before uh, committing, but uh, you know, I think you'll enjoy the book. So just go ahead and head over there and pledge. Uh, Stig wrote in about this. I mean, how topical is this? <laughs> Ion Maiden. Ion Maiden, not Iron Maiden, but Ion. Uh, this is 3D Realms, uh, Duke Nukem 3D. I, like you don't know who 3D Realms is. Uh, anyway, they are bringing back their build engine, uh, which did power those games. Um, it's called an old school throwback game. The Ion, Ion Maiden is the real deal, using our original tech from that famous era that launched the genre. Uh, this is on early access at, on Steam for $18. Uh, and the reviews are really stellar for this, so I, th <laughs> I think it's very serendipitous. There we go. Uh, this would come out just as I'm doing this video, because uh, uh, I think you would really enjoy that game. Uh, Stig also wrote in about this one. It's the St. Christopher's School Lockdown. It's a quote-unquote subversive, irreverent, point-and-click adventure game set in a prestigious British institute. Uh, now, what I really uh, caught my eye was this uh, art direction on this. Really interesting looking. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, a little bit maybe of The Last Express, if you remember that one from back in the day. Uh, but anyway, this one looks like it's got some great puzzles and mini games. And uh, it's also got some kind of contemporary themes, political themes, I guess, or whatever the <laughs> social themes uh, that you're seeing is kind of uh, culturally relevant, I guess we can say. Uh, but anyway, that's $11.99 on Steam, and Stig wanted to get some attention on that game uh, and the developers, so there you go. And then lastly, uh, <laughs> I got some good news and some bad news. Okay, the, the good news is that for the first time ever, I guess, legally anyway, uh, you can play the JRPG Classic Chrono Trigger on your PC, right? Uh, you can buy it right off of Steam. <laughs> and you think, wow, that's amazing, right? Uh, uh, there's a, a problem or two, though, uh, shall we say. Uh, apparently, they just really dropped the ball on this conversion, this port. It's just hard. I mean, uh, reading these reviews, <laughs> it's just like, wow. Uh, just totally screwed, uh, screwed the pooch on that one. Uh, the developer has responded uh, to the sort of flood <laughs> floodgate of negative reviews. They say they are, uh, quote, reading and listening and assessing, and they'll, we'll get back to them soon. But, uh, wow, <laughs> you know, you really would have expected a little bit better treatment for such a, uh, you know, a, a really great game. I mean, even I've played that one, and I hardly have played any uh, GRPGs, so uh, that should tell you something. Okay. I think that will do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? <laughs> oh boy, what do we have here? Uh, here, my friends, is a Grand Reserve 17. Aged with French oak, 
bottle fermented ale bottled in 2015 dark ale on lees ale brewed with spices aged with french oak i just said that <laughs> and with natural flavors added uh, this is one from uh, unibrow unibrew i think it's probably unibrew in french it looks more like unibro or unibrowy uh, that's out of canada chamley quebec it is 10 percent alcohol by volume and it is inspired by the great Belgian brewing traditions of Trappist monks established over the centuries. Apparently this one was first brewed in 2007, so I guess this, they must do this every year, thus the 17. And let's see, what else do they tell us about it? Um, this won some awards, world's best dark ale. Da -da -da. Bottle fermented with the Grand Reserve App Appellation as a fitting endorsement of its exceptional quality for aging. Brewed only once a year in limited quantities and individually numbered brassier, 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 not brassier, bottles. This is truly a flavorful delight for the specialty beer enthusiast. And I, my friends, am a specialty beer enthusiast, if I do say so myself. So uh, I am really excited about this one. I, I like Unibrow's other beers. Uh, they've got quite a few you can i don't know what it's like where you are but i can find them pretty regularly any uh, decent sized liquor store will have some uh, but anyway let's get this sucker open and see what it's all about all right it is time once again for matt barton's first person shooter game <laughs> can he hit the camera with a cork and if he ever manages uh, to succeed in doing that i guess it will be the end of the show because the camera will probably be destroyed you know i'm sorry i wonder if that is is this the brassier uh, that they were talking about the brassier is kind of like a little bra for your bottle maybe <laughs> i don't know it's not made out of brass it could be a little little hat maybe you know okay here we go let's see oh there's a little what is this <laughs> a little tag i guess all right all right let me loosen oh okay this one's ready to go Aim down the sights. Come oh, on, Matt. We can do it this time. I know. I feel good about this. I feel like I got it this time. I, I tell you, it's just... Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. Oh! <laughs> wow, that hit the wall and it came bouncing back. Whew. And I got to get this one in the horn right away. It is... It is excited to be here, let me tell you. Let me see if I can... Uh myself positioned here. I should get hazard pay for this episode. Jeez. Okay, you know, somehow I've managed never to spill any beer on the carpet in here. That is quite a feat. All right, Grand Reserve 17. Ooh, that's <laughs> Oh my God, this, this smells amazing. It's like a, oh man, this is probably one of the best beers I've ever smelled. Yeah, they just, I mean, it's got that great aromatic uh, sort of cherry and bourbony, a little bit of a, uh, I guess a oaky, an oak-like aroma, which makes sense uh, considering <laughs> uh, they brewed it in those barrels, right? Well, let's see, I don't really want to do this. Get a little too excited here. Uh, let's give this a taste. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is a, ooh. <laughs> That's definitely strong. You, you sort of first taste that sort of cherry, chocolatey, that, that sort of smoky uh, flavor, really kind of a dark flavor, but also really sort of sweet there. Um, sweet and dark, I guess we could say. Uh, not bitter at all. Well, let me try it again here. Yeah, this is just, I mean, the, it's got the, a great uh, texture to it. Uh, it's very, you know what I'm really tasting here is the cherry and the sort of a chocolatey flavor, uh, but mostly just on that, that cherry end. It's like, almost like a, uh, maybe like a cherry liqueur. It's almost that level of, of sweetness, but there's also a bit of peach in here. Um, let me try it one more time. Yeah, I think that's what I think that's what I come away 
uh, with here. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, uh, cherry flavor, a lot of chocolatey. You definitely get that oak and that sort of smoky uh, smokiness from the uh, barrel aging process. I mean, they just did everything perfect with this. It's, it's really extraordinary. You know, I'm going to give it one more go. Uh, yeah, that, that's really good stuff. You know, and I, I, I wanted to say a toast this time. <laughs> that's now that I'm sort of evaluating it. And I'll go ahead and say this is a full five out of five drinking horns uh, for the uh, Grand Reserve uh, 17. Uh, but I wanted to uh, raise the horn one more time in a toast. Uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, long-term, long-time friends of the show, uh, personal friends, his uh, mother passed on. Uh, so I wanted to uh, say a special shout out toast to her. Uh, so here's to you, uh, Lila the Viking. <sighs> Skull. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote. And uh, thinking about uh, Lila, I was looking up for quotes about mothers, and I found this one uh, by Mark Twain. It goes something like this. My mother had a great deal of trouble with me, but I think she enjoyed it. See you guys next week.